Welcome back. Uh, Administration of Justice 105, Criminal Law Today. This should be the book that you're using. Uh, make sure it's the fifth edition. We ran into some trouble this last week where the uh, discussion question wasn't the same. The answers for the discussion question wasn't the same. Now, these are available if you don't have it. They're available in our Learning Resource Center in the library, so you can check out a copy. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items really quick. I noticed some people are posting their discussion questions, their initial discussion questions, a little bit late. It's really important we get those in. Remember, the due date for your initial discussion question is Tuesday, midnight Pacific Standard Time. This gives your peers the ability to uh, just kind of debate this with you. Say, hey, here's what I think you did well. Here's what you did. And you guys are doing a great job, by the way. There's a few of you that could elaborate a little bit more. I've sent you that feedback. I'm asking for a little more. I don't just want you to write it. I want you to think about it. I need to see that you really understand the concept. Complete concept comprehension is what we're going for. Uh, so I need you to get those in. Also, remember to be working on your papers that are due at the end of the uh, semester and your projects, your group projects. So you're going to want to start developing your group. Send me a list of who's in your group. All right, so our first discussion question talked about the U.S. Constitution and how it was divided into three branches and why. And we also talked about judicial review and how that came about. Now, I really enjoyed this one. Marbury v. Madison is probably my favorite case of all time because it really showed the justice system and how it has to be flexible, how it's up to interpretation, but how it's important to understand uh, precedent. And precedent is something that we've decided before, right? Stare decisis, which is Latin for let the decision stand. And Chief Justice Marshall was really in a difficult spot there. And a lot of you guys really identified that, but I saw some, you got some uh, missing points that I just wanted to clarify. So in Marbury v. Madison, what we had was a lot of political pressure. So we had somebody going out in a lame duck period and appointing people to positions, and they didn't want to give the appointment. So here's Chief, Just Mar Chief Justice Marshall, who, mind you, hated everything Jeffersonian. Everything Jeffersonian. And he had a lot of pressure from his group to vote against anything Jeffersonian. On the other side of things, he knew that he really didn't have the right to give that writ. So in a just brilliant political move and brilliant judicial move, he publicly chastised one side saying, you should have given this appointment. You should have done it. It's your job. Then on the other side, he said, but I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the power to make you do it. So he made this side happy by saying, you should have done it. He made this side happy by saying, I don't have the power to do it. But what everybody missed was in the background, what he was doing was gathering up all this power for the judicial branch. See, they used to be kind of um, the little brother, right, that followed the, the legislative and the executive branch around. I was just the judicial branch. But now we've got our own power of judicial review. What he essentially said was, hey, I have the right, I being the judicial branch, have the right to interpret the intent of the framers. How did he know he didn't have the power to give out that? Well, because he said, I interpret the Constitution. Again, I not being him uh, specifically, but the judicial branch. And that was huge. That was a huge movement for them. So while these two parties are, are so proud of themselves because they thought they won, uh, and in a sense they did, he really put aside his own political beliefs about voting against Jefferson and anything Jeffersonian and said it's important to maintain the law and maintain precedent and stare decisis, which is what he did. And then he set that up, which is sort of a almost a veto power for the judicial branch where they can say that something is unconstitutional. So you guys did a great job on that. I just want to make sure that we, we really knew the impact of what Chief Justice Marshall was doing. Last week, discussion question two asked you to look at the standards of proof and their uses, which you guys did a great job. And then it asked to uh, talk about the burden of proof. That's one of the great things in this country. The standards of proof are important because what if you could be convicted just on uh, uh, you know, preponderance of evidence? That would be horrible. And what on the other side of it, if a, a police officer had to use uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt just to get a warrant, it wouldn't work out very well, right? So it's important that we have that, that we have those standards of proof because they're applicable in the various uses. Now, as far as uh, the, the second part of that, it's important for us to understand that in this country, we don't have to prove that we're innocent. We uh, don't have the burden of proof. That's on the state. In criminal cases, now civil's different, but in criminal cases, it's important to understand that we just get to sit back and say, you have to prove your case. Uh, we saw this in the Casey Anthony case. They did, their defense was what's called a failure to prove. They essentially said the prosecution didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. As we go through, we'll talk more about what is reasonable. What does reasonable mean? But for now, it's important to understand that we have it, and you guys are doing a great job with your discussion questions, so keep them up, and I'll check in with you guys next week.